Hi, my name is Dennis, and I'm a musician and educator. Thanks for joining us. We're here today to take part in Loop Create, a day of inspiration and activities featuring some of our favorite artists right now. We're going to do uh, and talk about a lot of different things related to music, but there's a thread that runs through everything today, which is this idea of collaboration, the different ways we can make music together. First, it maybe is important to acknowledge that if you're used to working alone, collaborating with other people can be a little scary. And even if you do it a lot, it's sometimes still tricky. When you talk to people who do this a lot, you often hear there are ways of navigating these challenges. It's not just luck or chemistry. There are attitudes and strategies, perspectives and states of mind that experienced collaborators can teach us. That's why we've invited our first guest to come talk to us today. Sam Slater has produced music for stage and screen, live performances and studio recordings, using experimental techniques and field recordings to make deeply moving music. He's worked with all kinds of people, including instrumentalists, composers, software engineers, and film directors. But he's best known for his extraordinary collaborations with his partner, Hildur Gudnadottir. He produced her award-winning scores for Chernobyl and Joker, and the two worked together most recently as co-composers and producers on the soundtrack for the video game Battlefield 2042. He's here with us today to share his thoughts on the art of collaboration. Sam, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Good. I want to start talking about sort of your early collaborative experiences. You started out as a drummer and pursued songwriting before moving to Berlin. Were you already thinking? I mean, these are worlds of music making that are really about playing with other people. Were you, sure. So you've been thinking about collaboration from the start? Yeah, I don't know if I would have known the terms, you know, wouldn't have been thinking it in that way necessarily. But obviously when you, you pick up drumsticks for the first time, uh, for me, aged 11, I uh, I wanted to play in a band, you know. I saw bands in front of me that I adored at the time and wanted to emulate and to, um, yeah, sort of model my existence on, on that. So, yeah, collaboration meant finding friends and finding friends and making a band and working out how that worked. And um, Do you have some early wins that you remember? Early, early wins? Wins of collaboration, things that made you be like, yeah, this works. I want to um, do more of this. I don't know. The whole process is just thrilling. You know, I think it was um, the, my friends that I played with um, for years and years and years. We were we were dotted around the area that we grew up in, and it was an excuse to get together and spend time socially with people that you, you know, some of whom I didn't go to school with. And it was a way of getting people in the same room together. It was social, super social. Um, so... I don't know if I think about it in terms of win wins. My neighbors definitely wouldn't think about it in terms of wins. <laughs> but um, but it was it was rewarding and it was something I would look forward to. Um, and I can remember like skipping skipping whatever I felt wasn't necessary because I was excited to do, you know, band practice. This aspect of the collaborations coming out of social relationships reminds me of this quote. Hilder said that she tends to only work with people she's close with friends, yeah. family, and you, of course. Do you ever collaborate with people that you don't first have this social connection with? Um, yes, yes and no. I, I mean, first of all, uh, Hilda says hello, um, and uh, she couldn't be here today because of some health issues. Um, so, but she's fine, so that's good. Um, and I, you know, the collaboration, I think, can't start in the dark, I don't think. It is a personal thing, and and, um sure some sometimes you know people better than others um but i don't feel it's necessary to i think prioritizing the personal before you prioritize the kind of musical connection actually can lead to a more it, it often leads to a deeper and more interesting collaboration and so i think for example hilda had so-called rule of you know working with with friends and family as much as possible first of all she has a very talented you know she's got a talented family they're all musicians so she doesn't need to collaborate with with many other people but um it you don't have to speak with people you know really well you don't have to explain what you want so collaborations can be deeper when the personal is is there as a foundation yeah um you've said it's important to understand the benefits of a collaboration before you get into it maybe to figure out if you even need to collaborate on this project at all can you talk more about that is it about well, in, I guess in some cases it's about hanging out, but is it sometimes about getting access to skills you don't have otherwise or just a different vibe or mindset or just another opportunity to hang out with a person in the room? Well, I think, 
I think that's interesting. You know, you've got to reflect on what it is. Why have you chosen in that moment to not, you know, to, to break down your studio walls and, you know, step outside of your interaction with your DAW and, and to find someone who can, who can bring something or um, reflect on the project that you're working on, who can create sort of uh, additional colors and additional kind of just angles and ways of approaching things. Um, it's not always necessary, but I think when you do decide to do that, the question to ask yourself is like, am I seeking, am I seeking to just make my thing better here? Or am I seeking to learn something? Am I seeking to make a friend potentially? Um, personally, I always, I'd kind of rather make a friend, get to know someone a bit better um, and uh, have a rewarding collaborative experience that potentially doesn't yield any music. Um, and this happens occasionally where you're like, well, this, this, we should never show anyone the thing that we've just made here. But at the same time, like I can remember those collaborations and they have value and they, they, you grow, I think, through the, the interpersonal more than I need a bassist. Who's a bassist? Yeah. Um, we were talking about, you were using this phrase, talking about extracting value from a collaboration as being one maybe potentially negative way to approach the, the project. I think the, the, the sort of content economy that we find ourselves in as musicians and artists, we've all got to, you know, got to pay the rent. Um, and, but there are pressures on you as an artist to, which can often, I think, lead you to, to, to focus inwardly more than is, is healthy. And to see the people around you, instead of seeing them as, um, instead of seeing them as other humans who are also on their own journeys through life and, um, you can sort of uh, see them as sort of like opportunities to extract value. Um, you know, ah, you have this many social media followers. If I, if I can just get you as a featured artist on my record, that will give me this opportunity to do X, Y, Z. But I think in doing that, you can dehumanize the person in front of you and minimize the opportunity for like a really meaningful collaboration. Um, sometimes, you know, I would argue many times that's just not the most healthy way of interacting with, with anyone, let alone music. Um, yeah, you might end up with a bunch of shiny objects at the end, but like no depth. Totally. Yeah. Um, I think we talked about this briefly before, but it's the difference between content and substance, right? Are you making content? Are you making substance? I would hope that, or I would argue that if you're just making content, then sometimes you've just got to find the nearest thing to you or the best way of, the best way of achieving your ends of producing the content you need to do. But then on the other side, there's, there's substance and they, it can look remarkably similar, but to make substance, I think requires, um, requires time and care, kindness, um, humility as well. And uh, yeah, the, the, to admit that, you know, maybe, maybe the, the most productive thing you can do in a collaboration is actually to just like hang out and, have a cup of tea and, uh, you know, actually not make or release the music you dreamed you'd make with that person. Right. So I want to pivot to talking a little bit about your work with Hildur. Mm -hmm. Um, when you first started working together, it was on a score by Johan Johansson yeah. with you as the producer and thinking about the thing that you were saying before about how sometimes the collaborative process is with somebody, you know, so well that you don't have to talk. Sure. She was saying that her relationship with Johansson was mostly nonverbal. As sure. a producer in that environment, like, how do you not get in the way? Um, how do you not get in the way? Uh, humility, I think it's probably the answer. I hope, I hope that there was some humility there. I try. Um, you know, jo Johan was a, he was a, he was an intense dude and he, he was really, he had clear ideas and he had a long standing creative relationship with Hilda. Um, and they made, they made beautiful work together. And I think, um, in that case, the best way to contribute is honestly to, to acknowledge that and not seek to put your own stamp on it. You know, there were many places where I got to put my stamp on, on these larger projects, but often you would watch two people that had a history of interacting, interact and recognize that you're like, 
it's a privilege to be in the room and the best thing I can do is really just acknowledge that and sit sit and be with actually right. so when you started working with Hilder on Chernobyl yeah. that was theoretically the same roles right with her as composer sure. performer and you as producer was this like a continuation of the work with Johan or was there something something emerging that was new well so that was the first time I'd worked with Hilda uh with her her as the the composer uh, alone and me as the producer alone as well and there was a really interesting you know we had a clear idea about what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it um we wanted to go to a nuclear reactor in lithuania with chris watson uh the amazing field recordist and we wanted to record a nuclear reactor and then build a soundtrack from it um this was quite a new approach for Hilda. I'd done a lot of processing field recordings before. She's done, le she's done less of that, but she had an incredibly strong compositional voice. You know, she, that woman can write some tunes, you know, they're in, it's in, remarkable. So the, qu the questions that we had was how to realize this idea, how to acknowledge the strengths of each person and the natural kind of, the natural hierarchies that exist between, you know, her response, she has responsibility for the project as a composer, how to respect these dynamics without um, stifling anyone's voice. Um, and at the same time, also by not um, letting the sort of technical side of things blast over the, um, her way of composing. So that was this, there were a lot of balances, a lot of things to keep kind of keep aware of. What is the the, the breakup of uh, spills of skill sets between the two of you? Like, what is she good at, and what are you good at? Ooh, uh, that's a good question. Um, if I'm being uh, cheeky, I always say that she <laughs> she she writes the notes and I make them sound pretty. Um, but I think that's realistically a disservice to someone who is a truly uh, impressive orchestrator um, and. You know, when we're um, when we're working on things where there's more sound design within the actual kind of voice, then I think that's really true. You know, she doesn't spend a lot of time obsessing over, you know, how to, you know, use, you know, any form of processing. That's not really her, her way of articulating music. She wants to see melodic lines moving through space and over time and write these write these parts that kind of move and wrap around each other. And that's how she thinks about music. I think about music as a stack of frequencies um, and I want to work out how to change color over time. You could see how those two things can actually la latch onto each other. So in those contexts, the best way to collaborate is to let each other's skills just, just sit and not just be aware that you're leaving space for the other person to be as good as possible. Then you take something like her most recent projects actually that she's done, um, which is Tar and a film called Women Talking. And uh, she asked me if I'd like to to be a part of that. And it was very quickly clear that, that they're, they're quite orchestral. You know, they're quite orchestral, they're quite um, acoustic scores. And that the best way that I can collaborate was actually to just not participate. And that, that was cool. I realized that the, that, you know, that's cool. I was like, wow, this is another part of our collaboration, but I'm going to just like, you know, wish you best and give you feedback if you need it. And, you know, it wasn't my strength, so it's not, I shouldn't impose myself on it. So that was cool. You've talked a bit about how uh, when you work with people that you know well, the collaboration can be like a slow process, but you also have been telling me about this recent project you did that was quite the opposite, right? Like fast and furious. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what this was? Sure. So um, we just premiered um, a new sort of live ensemble um, at Unsound Festival in, in Krakow. And um, it involved myself, uh, James Ginsberg, uh, Ruli Shabara, and also Hilda as well. And the idea was we've all been instrument building for quite a while. Um, and we wanted to bring these three instruments um, uh, together into an ensemble. Um, and they are, they're all 
they're largely based around feedback. So Hilda has a cello that self oscillates. It's got speakers in the back of it. Um, I've been building a, a drum, which is, um, again, it has a large transducer in the bottom of it. And um, it also kind of self oscillates and growls. And um, then James has the power plank, which is a six string bass that you, you, you hit. And it's only tuned in octaves and fifths at about 40 hertz. It's very heavy. And we wanted to bring this ensemble together. And Matt, uh, who runs the festival, suggested that we get Ruli involved um, because all good bands need a vocalist. And Ruli, Ruli's, he turned up and was like, I just want to take sounds from these instruments and then recreate them with my voice. Um, in the background, we also thought it was a great idea to add robots to everything. So there was, Always. yeah. So all good bands need a vocalist and a kind of robot, uh, robot um, backup. So it's a kind of robot metal band is the idea. That sounds great. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah. um, switching gears a little bit, please. Although yeah. I really want to hear the robot band. Yeah. Um, when we first invited you to, to talk here today and talked about what the topic would be, you told us that for you, collaboration is listening, which is also the title of this keynote. Can you talk a little bit about what that means to you? What, why is listening important? Yeah, I mean, again, this is, a, this is a larger conversation that I've been having with various friends that you know, I have the privilege of, of working with over a longer time. And I sort of feel as though the way in which creativity exists in 2022 can often be so much about stamping yourself as hard as possible. You're prying yourself into situations quite forcefully. You know, you have to, you have to have your, your sort of your identity. So, so fixed. And, and uh, um, while I do think it's a beautiful thing for artists to have a singular identity and I, I love that we work towards that, I believe that leaving space for receptivity is just, it's just so vital. And I sort of am dreaming of a, <laughs> I'm dreaming of a world where that's, uh, that's just more available, that people don't have the answers to all questions and that there isn't a receptivity. And, um, and collaboration is a great example. It's a great space in which we can be um, deliberately receptive you know, in which we can um, have fixed aesthetic ideas that can be in contrast to the person who sat in front of you and you can prioritize, you can prioritize sort of like letting it slide and seeing, seeing what happens. And that kind of personal challenge, I think makes for a better, I think it makes for a better artist ultimately, because you're, you're chipping away at ideas you have about yourself. Um, and yeah, that involves listening. Mm. So that's sort of, yeah. I mean, you know, the, the sort of easy answer about what listening is, it's like, well, of course, musicians do this anyway, right? Listening is something all music producers do. Is the skill of listening to music well transferable to the skill of listening to your collaborators well? Sure. Yeah, in some, some ways. I mean, again, maybe it comes back to our point about value extraction in a little way. You're like, I know lots of people that like listen to music because what they're trying to do is scrape the newest production techniques off, you know, whatever is around them so they can fold it back into their own, into their own work. And I definitely, you know, am guilty of doing that <laughs> sometimes. I think we all are. And the same with the people around you. You could be sort of like listening to someone, but, but not um, being truly receptive. And that's, I suppose, the difference is sort of like a, there's more aggression in one than the other. And I'm sort of, I think really deep in beautiful collaborations, the, the, uh, the, the walls kind of break down and you're truly, you're truly listening. <laughs> and uh, um, yeah, and that's beautiful when that happens actually. Uh, so I'm hoping for more of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, over the last few years, for the pandemic reasons, we've all become kind of used to working remotely. Mm -hmm. You've once said that studios are where good collaborations start. How important is it for you to literally be in a room with someone when you're doing the collaboration? Gosh, yeah, that sounds like a pre-pandemic comment, doesn't it? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it, I don't think it matters. Um, I think there's so much. Maybe it, it matters. It's a different thing to be sat in front of. You know, this conversation would be m very different if you were on a screen in front of me, um, which I don't believe you are. I'm not. You're not. <laughs> um, but that being said, the technology um, really is facilitating some pretty remarkable things when it comes to sort of long distance collaboration. And I think it opens up a lot of opportunities, actually. You can fold, you can fold the sort of uh, inability to control every variable into your work because you get something back you didn't expect. Um, and you know, I, I did a project recently where that was an inherent part of the composition. You know, I worked with a lot of artists that I adore. Most of it personally, just I love these people. Um, and then you're like, oh, okay, well, that means that this is my ensemble. And I, you know, I'm working with these instrumentalists, apparently, and my record will therefore, you know, it'll be more like this than this because I like these people. But they're a long, they're a long way away. So we're going to use audio movers and we're going to use whatever technology around us to try and, um, you know, make it as seamless as possible. But at the same time, because they're not in the room with me and I can't say, hey, play more like this or, you know, do this or move that microphone there, my creative limit is simply to say, whatever you send back, I'm going to use. Like, this is what I'm interested in. Maybe this sent one person some words and a, and a, and a sound I really liked. I was like, what does this make you think? And she sent back an SM58. She's like, I'm thinking something like this, but that is the recording on the record. She was a heartbroken. She was like, that was the first thing I did. That's the first thing I did. But to me, that's so exciting that you, she would have never, we would have never had this performance if it weren't for the distance and the, 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 the sort of restrictions imposed by, by distance. Ah, so, so she was expecting that you were going to do something with it and you left it. As no, it I think, was. I think she was expecting that, the the um, and as was everyone, I think that they were sort of expecting that this would be, say we're in a room together and working together. Essentially, she was like, well, are you thinking something like this? Now, if you're in a studio together, I'm going to say like, no, I'm thinking something more like this. Can we try more like that? Like much more in the details. Exactly. Right? And then all I'm doing is stamping my aesthetics on you rather than letting your response just exist. But if you're collaborating over email and long distance, then you can hear something kind of more spontaneous. And I have to react to what's sent to me um, because I can't control, I can't go back and d dial in every detail. Um, I mean, you probably could, but it would probably be unbearable for everyone because it would be endless chains of communication. Totally. And then how am I going to describe that, that, that inflection or that little thing here or that little thing there over email? It doesn't work. So yeah. um, I think it can be kind of creative as well. Right. This this awareness about the sort of interesting potential of remote work? Is this something you figured out during the pandemic or had you been exploring these kinds of things before? Well, so, I mean, when we work on film projects, most of the time we're working with people in the States or um, in the UK. So I'm used to the idea that distance is involved. I've done projects with people in India before. I'm actually doing a project with, with an Indian production company right now. I'm used to that. But often it's more in the kind of, you're dealing more with practicalities. You know, it's the delivery of, you create something here and you deliver it there. I feel like the pandemic opened up, it forced you to, to, to work out how to be creative over those distance as well as just pragmatic, um, which is a big difference. Um, and I noticed that me, my friends around me, we all got better at it. Um, it was like a new skill that you learn how to do. Uh, and some of those techniques have actually kind of stuck, even though we can, you know, the world's kind of loosening up again, but still you're like, you know, you're like, well, I, I actually, I can work in this way. Um, I know you're there and I know I'm here, but let's do it like this and it'll, we'll get something good. Don't worry. Yeah, um, it's nice to think that 
it wasn't all about concessions to that time. Like, I think a real silver lining might have been that you learned something new. As oh, a, totally, as a practice, right? Totally, and it's 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 unexpected, and it's um, it makes in some ways it makes previous ideas seem quite restrictive. I hope people do more of it. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Well, we're closing in on the end of our time here. I want to thank you so much for, for this talk. I feel like we could have taken any of these threads and gone in a hundred different directions. Possibly so, Maybe yeah. we can afterwards. We can go get, we could go do get that. a drink and, and talk about it some more. Um, so cool. thank, thank you, you so much for being here, Sam. I really appreciate it. All right.